was, and I found Herb Newman because my friend Carol Mailer said he's a fabulous person and architect. So Carol, thank you for introducing us. He was supposed to be here a couple of years ago, but he fell and hurt his, was it your hip? And then last year was the virus, so we got him. Now this is the year for Herb Newman. Um, And we have a lot of his friends here, so I hope you'll got, be, come back and see our other programs that we're going to have. Um, Herb Newman is the founder of Newman Architects and has been a visionary in master planning, urban design uh, for over 50 years. He began his career with IM Pay in New York. Uh, among a host of his achievements, Herb is a fellow of the American Institute of Architecture. Today, we're going to explore uh, the change and permanence, both in Palm Beach and beyond, through the architecture eye. Is that one working? No, no, let's find out. How is that? Okay. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. And there's going to be time after he talks for questions and answers. That's the whole purpose of this, so that you can really talk. I don't think you even have to put that there. There you go, there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dale, and thank you very much for the Cordura Institute. And This afternoon, uh, I thought that I would uh, talk about, uh, and the title of this talk, uh, when uh, Dale asked me to see if I could make it sexy, uh, uh, what the answer was, uh, Gimme give, give Shelter, uh, a song by uh, Mick Jagger, uh, 1968 vintage, uh, in which he was uh, asking us to make love, not war. Uh, a very appropriate title for what's going on in the world today um, and what uh, may be going on in the future of Palm Beach. And so uh, a subtitle for this talk would be the, the past, the present, and the future of Palm Beach. And uh, uh, louder, very good, is that better? Okay, uh, uh, let me back up for a moment. And uh, And, and show you uh, the Florida Peninsula. Uh, that's Cuba down at the bottom, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula over on the left. And that fuzzy thing in the middle, that white fuzzy thing, is something we'll talk about a little later. This picture was taken in by satellite in 1992. It's, it's, it's uh, Hurricane Andrew. And he's, Andrew is heading west as, uh, as this picture was taken. Uh, the Florida Peninsula is verdant. It's, it's marvelously green, and uh, with the Enlightenment, starting about 200 or so years ago, uh, technology has brought uh, Florida to new heights, in, and the idea of refrigeration and air conditioning and trains and cars and planes have redrawn the map of Florida. And uh, this is a picture taken again by a satellite over Miami Beach, I'm sorry, Palm Beach, I won't say that again, over Palm Beach and, and, uh, and, uh, and West Palm Beach. Uh, there's a parallel between uh, the grid that forms Manhattan, uh, that formed uh, Palm Beach as well, and so that it is very easily flexible and adaptable uh, to, for pedestrians and, and all of the traffic that came with cars and bikes. Uh, and the, uh, uh, there's a couple of different ways to think about cities. Uh, cities can be thought of as the city as a piece of architecture. Say that again? A little louder, okay. How is that? All right, you might have to strap in your seat belts. But, uh, all right, the uh, thinking of the city as, as the architecture, 
then one can start thinking of the buildings as wallpaper rather than as objects in themselves. And they can think of the streets and the paths as ways to make the space flexible and adaptable. Another way of thinking about architecture is think that our, thinking of a city or a town is really a bunch of wonderful architecturally designed buildings. But the problem with that is that these wonderful architecturally designed buildings are often self-reflecting and, and self-involved and don't really add up to making a city. Often the, the parts are not anywhere, are, are greater than the whole. Whereas if one can think about a city as the architecture in which the buildings themselves sublimate themselves to serve the city and the people who live in them, that leads to things called communities in which diversity and caring about all of the people who live in the town and the, or the city can share in the benefits. And, and so I, I'm not here to bury Palm Beach. I'm here to praise it. Uh, Palm Beach is a place that I have come to love, living in Manalapan for the last 20 years. And I think that, in a way, Palm Beach exemplifies an, uh, the American dream. And I'll get to show you that in a few moments. But one of the ways that Palm Beach excels is in its diversity of what I would call the public realm and the private realm. And uh, an example of the, whoops, ex example of the public realm would be the, the Folger, the, the museum, uh, which was a private residence, but which has a great lawn in front of it and which is very inviting and accessible and invites the public to share in its wonder of the building itself, but also what's inside. Another would be the marvelous walkways and bike paths. Uh, this is over on the western side of the intercoastal, in which the public is invited to participate in the wonders of the edges of Palm Beach, the wonderful water edges, and, and as well as this gray, great green, lush, jungle-like environment. Uh, now, another of the great public realm places is Worth Avenue which is a place with glass on the ground floor so that people shopping and people in the shops looking out can share uh, its common purpose of buying things. And, uh, and it's a great pedestrian place. And it was put together by a great visionary, Addison Meisner. It also has architecture, which sometimes doesn't work with the uh, idea of city building. That building over on the right, for instance, which is, uh, I'm not knocking it because it's a modern building, and I'll defend modern architecture in a little while, but it's a building which is out of scale. It's a building that doesn't have an interesting profile. It's a building that doesn't have an interesting silhouette with the marvelous blue skies of South Florida. It's a building whose long strip windows uh, expect it to be somewhere on a plain, out in the Midwest or something, or out in a desert, but not, on a, not in a place of human scale and of intimacy, which makes Palm Beach so great. So oh, I'm not suggesting we knock that building right now, but I think those are the kinds of things, whoops, that we have to watch out for. That's okay. Uh, now, this is some of Addison Meisner's work further to the uh, western side of uh, Worth Avenue, marvelously scaled. The arcades help keep the shade to save us from the sun and the marvelous silhouette of the turrets and towers and dormers uh, make for a very lively and exciting streetscape and a place one wants to be. And what's very nice about it also is that there are shops on the other side of the street. So even though Worth Avenue is one way, uh, it's, it's easily crossed and transversed. And then the wonderful little Ma uh, Via Meisners and alleyways that are so pedestrianly beautifully scaled. And uh, the courtyards and the places to walk and explore and discover. All of these attributes of, uh, of, of, of Palm Beach welcome the public and, and can really be considered part of the public realm, even though they may be privately owned shops. And then this, I believe, the, yeah, this is a picture. Oh, I should mention that. The woman who took most of these photographs, Sally Mickelberg, is sitting over there. She 
She's lucky she's alive because she would get out of the car as I was driving um, and take these pictures. First thing, she was avoiding getting run over by me, which was a great accomplishment in itself. But others were swearing at her and giving her the finger. I mean, it's not a very friendly Palm Beach uh, gesture. However, it was real because she was in the way. But she's the one who took most of these pictures. Here she's safe on the island along Royal Poinciana. Golf course over on the left, shops on the right, marvelously scaled, inviting human use and activity. And uh, now let's get on to something else. Here we go. I'm not used to this two-fisted. Uh, lecturing system. Okay, there's the there's a marvelously scaled architecture. None of it's outstanding. None of it is absolutely beautiful, but it's serving a greater purpose, which is a sense and a love of what is going on here. I think that as an architect, uh, as an example, for instance, I should say, architects really shouldn't be doing architecture if they don't love people, because we provide shelter and use. And if you don't care about the people you're serving, you shouldn't perhaps be doing sculpture or graphics or uh, selling real estate, but you should not be practicing architecture. I, I'm not knocking the real estate business. It's very good for us. Uh, um, now, this is Royal, Royal Way, Royal Palm Way, uh, and there's office buildings of five or six stories. But what's interesting is the architecture is really not the architecture of the buildings, which in this case is pretty good, but it's the building, it's the columns, which are the trees, so that it's one of uh, Palm Beach's greatest assets and one of its greatest gifts to the public realm in that these trees are really columns which give this no place a noble character. Uh, this marvelous park, uh, which is where Town Hall and, and the fire department is, and it shows a great civic pride at the heart uh, of Palm Beach. It's a, it's, a, it's a place which isn't used very often, but those who go there for lunch and to play bocce or whatever is going on in that green space uh, are really generally people with smiles on their faces as we drive by in our cars, avoiding them, avoiding running them over. Uh, uh, this is, one could actually imagine you're at the Alhambra in Granada uh, here. I mean, and one can see the inspiration of Weiser and the others who understood the sense of uh, hierarchy and importance of public space, which gives one, whether you're living in Palm Beach and among the very rich, or whether you're visiting Palm Beach among the middle class, or whether you probably, and, and the guys I must say who seem to me who are working the hardest in Palm Beach are the gardeners, the guys who are always out there on the street clipping those hedges. And let's Let's not forget these guys, because these guys are going to be owning those houses, or their children will in a few years. People who come to Palm Beach to work are not coming there because they hate it. They're coming there because they think, this could be me, this could be I, this could be my family. Look what these people are getting out of life here. I can make it myself. And that's a wonderful aspect of Palm Beach, which is a relatively new thing. It used to be much more exclusive uh, uh, than it is now. Um, and, and these marvelous monuments to the public. And then the idea of uh, the architecture of the landscape being more important than the architecture of the buildings themselves. A place of shade, a place to have lunch, a place to sit in this public park. And then the Breakers Hotel, which is a private place, but which offers, again, through its big expanse of entrance and its towers, a sense that this is a place for the public. It's a place that is accessible. It's a place that one can visit. It's a place that you can make your own, even though you may not have the money to stay there more than one or two nights and maybe just afford one lunch. But nonetheless, it's proving to you that there is a place, and it's this country and it's this town where you can achieve the glory of the American dream. We should not forget about that because, and I must say that for those people who have lived in Palm Beach, whom I've known for a very, very long time, there is a modesty and an acceptance of this as a fact. And I think that's, and, and to do that without showing off is really quite a wonderful characteristic. Uh, whoops, I'm jumping ahead. Uh, maybe I should. I'm, a, a church, uh, which in this particular case doesn't adorn itself with shrubbery, but opens itself in a, in a visit, in an accessible, inviting way uh, to the public. Uh, uh, this is a house by Fazio. Uh, a competitor of Meisner's, 
And this one, and this house is actually in Manalapan, um, but I brought it along because it's one of the more handsome houses in the Palm Beach region. Um, and it, it demonstrates the use of coral stone and indigenous rock, which is gonna have a story of its own when the floods come soon, but uh, it is marvelous architecture, well-scaled and, uh, and, and, and hidden from the public view because we're getting a peek here from the entranceway along A1A. So we're playing peekaboo, and I'll talk about the peekaboo uh, idea in a little while, but it gives those people who are driving by a sense of the glory of what's behind there. You don't know the family who lives there. You don't know what goes behind, on behind those walls, but you use your imagination and you wonder whether someday that will can be you or your children. And uh, the Norton Museum in West Palm Beach, uh, which is a wonderful uh, building designed by Norman Foster, which is accessible again to the public. I think that one of the things that makes Palm Beach work is West Palm Beach. Uh, West Palm Beach is sort of the same way La Défense works to the city of Paris. And we'll get to that in a second. And, and this is uh, a couple of frolicking females uh, enjoying themselves. I'm taking the photograph, of course, only because I'm related. But they are enjoying themselves down on Clematis uh, and uh, outside of this wonderful little French bistro, Pistache, uh, on an ordinary evening where there is a sense of gaiety and, uh, and fun. Uh, that often one doesn't find in Palm Beach. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the idea that there's breathing space and then you can let yourself go and be among the riffraff and, um, and, mess around, and mess around with others is something that we who have the luck of affluence uh, enjoy. Uh, it's a human trait. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, now, what, let me back up here a second. Now, here is the Paris we love in the foreground, a Paris in which heights are regulated, in which the architecture changes dramatically. Paris is not, Paris is not classic uh, French uh, revival architecture. There's modern and Gothic and, and everything else mixed together in a mishmash, but it all has human scale. It all has an appreciation of the human being and what you can see when you're walking down the street, what your eyebrow which is about 45 degrees above your eye, allows you to look up and see and enjoy the cityscape. And beyond is where all the junk is. So you're standing, at, right, this picture was taken from the Arc de Triomphe, looking west towards La Défense. Uh, the Bois de Boulogne is off to the left over there, and you see the skyline behind you. But th that is modern architecture, and some of it is quite interesting. In fact, you're looking at an arch, Let's see if I could point this. Let's see, I thought I could point this. I can point it. Now, that isn't the architecture. That's the, another arch, a modern arch, which is 20 times the size of the architecture. And it has people working in it, in these three sides. And so it's at this giant scale, as are these buildings, which are really daytime buildings. These are, this is a little bit of Manhattan, daytime Manhattan, on the edge of this marvelous city. Can you imagine if all of these towers were punctuating what this wonderful skyline of Paris would be like? It would be a terrible mess. And, uh, and, and the Parisians, and I, I, and I can't speak, I can't really say that the forefathers and the great preservationists and, and uh, conservationists of Palm Beach had this vision in mind when they limited the height of buildings on Palm Beach, but it sure was a good idea. And, it was, and the zoning laws are very, very good. That doesn't allow this kind of stuff to take place on the island of Palm Beach. But it delegates it to further west, just the way the Parisians did. And so you have this very lively daytime commerce taking place in La Defense, and let them have a good time there. And, but at night, when the things get al become alive, everyone moves east into the city of Paris for the delight of living. Uh, and there, there's the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower. When the Eiffel Tower was built, Eiffel, the engineer who designed it, was vilified uh, while it was being designed and while it was being built. He was spat on. 
by the Parisians who thought, this man is ruining our city. What is this tower doing in this marvelously human-scaled city? It, this building is awful. It's a, well, let's burn it down. Let's burn him. And of course, they didn't catch him. And, but when the Eiffel Tower was finished, people started kissing Eiffel's feet. They realized and turned and saw in just a very short time how wonderful that tower is to Paris and to the world. Uh, the, whoops, here's an architect. Oh, come on, there we are. An architect I worked for for about five or six years after I graduated from architectural school, I. M. Pei, who had the same treatment when he designed the Louvre. Uh, when he tried to walk the streets of Paris while, while the building was being designed and under construction. He was booed. Um, he was cursed in the newspapers. Um, I mean, and it got to the point of being somewhat prejudicial in terms of his race as well, but the, uh, and his nationality. Uh, nonetheless, when the Louvre was finished, and people saw this marvelous jewel amongst this marvelous architecture of the Louvre, minds and hearts changed. And I'm bringing this up because I want to point out that the future of Palm Beach is largely going to be modern architecture because the architecture that's being taught in almost every architectural school is modern architecture. And, and modern architecture is very young and it's not that good yet because Buildings that we're looking at in the Louvre, for instance, that comes from generations and centuries of refinement of traditional architecture, starting with great classical Egyptian, Greek, Roman architecture, and it's been refined. And we've got, all we see now is the best of what was. And what we're seeing in modern architecture, both in Palm Beach and elsewhere, is often not the worst, but it's just the condition of the way it is. And it's pretty crappy because we're just experimenting with it now. So modern architecture is generally pretty bad. However, when it's great, it's wonderful. So that's up to you guys when you're picking your architects to choose great architectures by great architects rather than mediocre stuff. Of course, one of the reasons for going for the mediocre is that it's a lot cheaper usually. And that has a lot to do with the pursuing mammon. And I think we could ease off on that a little bit uh, in our development. Uh, enough of that. This is Central Park in New York City, uh, this marvelous park by Olmsted. Um, and uh, it, it's an English country park in the middle of this unbelievably dense uh, urban environment, which is Manhattan. And it's the lungs. It's actually the lungs of Manhattan. It's the lungs of New York. And, uh, and imagine New York City without Central Park. I mention it because it's this issue of the public realm. It's the issue of caring and loving. The place you live enough to understand that your responsibility is not only to have the most beautiful home and the most beautiful interior, but it's the responsibility to the civic uh, sensibility of being a citizen of that place so that you and your children and your grandchildren can actually enjoy it because you're just enjoying something that's beyond yourself, a way, a way beyond your self-involvement. And that's, I think, in many ways, the greatest thing that architecture can do. It's also the hardest thing to do. Uh, this is uh, Rome, the Circus Agonalis. It is now the Piazza Navona in Rome. Many of you, I'm sure, have visited it. It's an absolutely marvelous civic space, started as a circus. This is a a drawing that we did of Meisner Park, which is based on the idea of the Piazza Navona. Meisner Park is in Boca Raton, Florida. We were not the architects of the building, but we did the master plan, which is based on the proportions of the Piazza Navona. And it's designed to be a place where people can shop and people can park. You can come in here and look for a parking space. You probably won't be able to find it, and we'll have to go into the parking garage which is around the perimeter, but it's the peekaboo experience again. You get a sense, hey, I might be able to find a parking spot here. And so you drive around and drive around and your wife or whoever is in love with you was at that time is cursing you for not going into the parking garage. But hey, you might find a space, but you may not. But even if you don't, you'll be able to park and come in and share the public promenade. The most exciting thing that humans being do is watching each other. 
is seeing and being seen. It's the public agenda. Uh, next, this is the Piazza Navona. More of the Piazza Navona. And this is a picture. Um, did I go through those too fast? I probably did not. And this is Meisner Park, uh, based upon those ideas. The architecture is done by a firm in, in Atlanta, Georgia, Cooper Carey, by name. And they're pretty good architects. But thank goodness you don't have to mess around and look at the architecture, because everything that's happening is down at the street, where the people are and where the fun is and the shopping. Whoops, I'll back up a second. This is a painting by Child Hassam, who was a great American Impressionist who did marvelous seascapes and uh, rural paintings, but he also became fascinated with New York. He lived in the early 20th century, and he became fascinated with the American flag and the quality of the American flag and what it does to Fifth Avenue in New York City. <clears throat> And so he spent much of his life painting the American flag from all different angles up and down New York City because he's, it wasn't that he was so much of a patriot. He was just so Im terribly impressed how the American flag actually made the architecture, which was okay, absolutely wonderful. And so the silhouette against the sky is the American flag. Uh, now, we uh, were asked to design a new building for the new School of Social Research in the Parsons School of Design on Fifth Avenue, just above Washington Park, uh, about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And that's the little building here that was a rent-controlled <laughs> apartment house and had such kind of laws around it that one could not knock it down. And this was, this is, was the Parsons School of Design. This is the, the Forbes office building right next to it. And so this was our site. And, and this very thin sliver right on Fifth Avenue. This is 12th Street. Uh, and what we did, oh my, wrong shot, sorry. I'll catch up with this. What we did was we made the building an American flag. We made the building a flag holder. So in celebration of Child Hassam, we made uh, 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 this very narrow, only 40 foot wide building, the, the, the standard, the post for the great American flag, which is put up at the top. And it all really is, has elevators in it and lobbies, which connect the two buildings that, that were both now owned by the New School of Social Research. And, but it was never executed because we, I should say we, but the Developers in the university could never <laughs> get the rent control department uh, out from under the law. And so uh, this remains one of my American dreams that never was realized. A wet dream, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, pictures of it looking up Fifth Avenue and looking down Fifth Avenue. And uh, that's the way it goes. Now, here is a building in the south, in Norfolk, Virginia, in uh, 2010, we were asked to become involved in a national competition for a new library for Norfolk, Virginia, a new public library um, by, the, by a family uh, which uh, was very, very rich, but very, very publicly minded and dedicated. And this building was built in the early 20th, in the early 20th century as a customs house. It was converted into a city hall, and uh, we proposed that this building, which was simply wonderful on a very nice street corner, actually be part of the new library. The problem with it is it, it's closed, and it's, it's a building that says, as a custom house, says, hey, beware, don't enter here. There could be trouble. Uh, this is a place where you have to be authorized to enter. So it was a very standoffish kind of building for a public library. And so this is a sketch that we did. And um, I can't say that that sketch is so wonderful that it won the competition, but it didn't hurt. But what we proposed was with the existing building over on the left, the Seabright building it's called, the Seaboard building rather, we proposed a transparent kind of open building which would be accessible and open to the public so that people would be invited to the library and have a sense that this was their palace 
And in a way, we called it the palace for the people, a place to find uh, utopia, a place where a child can come or an immigrant or many of the homeless and many of the homeless who were veterans of the, of the Navy living in Norfolk after the Second World War and Vietnam War and so on and so forth could find a place that welcomed them and treated them as if they were American citizens. And, uh, and so this is the building. That's the existing building over on the left. And we made the new building uh, virtually a glass, uh, a glass room and uh, with small pieces off it that welcomed and invited you into it to participate. And uh, the sculpture that uh, we've included is a sculpture of a, of a wonderful sculptor named Kent Bloomer uh, who designed the ornament for the building. I've, I've always been of the opinion that modern architecture, which is essentially wonderfully abstract, can benefit for more information than sometimes modern architecture will allow. So that there is a place, there is a place to grow things. There is a place to allow nature to be expressed the way ornament does in traditional buildings. And so it's something that I'm particularly interested in. And this is one of those examples. Uh, this is the entrance, the main entrance with uh, a skylight of um, what is meant to be kind of the trees in the forest providing shade uh, as you enter. And uh, the old building, which we, op see, we opened up, those were windows. Let's see if I can point to that. Doesn't matter. On the ground floor, smaller windows, uh, those openings were just windows. We opened them as a giant, we changed them to giant doors so that when you come in the library, you would be able to, you'd be um, intrigued by and invited to enter the old portion itself. And, and, and part of the renovation of the existing building. We're offering these illustrations to show you that it is possible that modern architecture can succeed in Palm Beach and that what's really important as um, Joseph Albers was a great uh, painter who left Nazi Germany in, in the uh, 1930s not because he was being persecuted, but because he couldn't stand the new Hitler idea about what art was. And uh, he came out with what I thought when I first heard it was a rather totalitarian point of view. I was a student in his class with a bunch of other architects and, and artists, and he said in a very whimsical German accent, it's hard to make a German accent whimsical, but he did it, and he, he was a little smile on his, on his she, uh, on his, in a twinkle in his eye, he said, I will tell you something that you won't believe, and so that's all right, but I think at the end of the year, I want you to tell me if you believe me, or am I lying, or am I crazy? And he said, I'm going to say this, there's no such thing as one color not going with another color. Every color goes with every other color. And now you will prove it to yourselves during the, this year, and you tell me what you think is the end. And anyway, he proved that he was right. And my point here is that every architectural style goes with every other architectural style. It just matters how you use it and how you respect the old and how you integrate the old with the new. And so the idea that Palm Beach is going go, and, and there's a number of modern buildings that I've seen that have already been knocked down in Palm Beach. Um, one of them I was missing on, on A1A. I, thought that maybe I, my memory had gone wrong, but inside of one year, just away for the summer, bingo, it was gone. Um, I'm not sure which building replaced it, and I can't even tell, which is also interesting because the fabric of the existing architecture, of the traditional architecture, has taken over. And I don't want to say like weeds, but like a fast-growing jungle of traditional architecture, and so you can't find the new anymore. And uh, I'm not knocking that, but I, but I don't think it's the only way. Uh, this is Lynn University uh, in Boca Raton, Florida. I won't explain this in the diagram. It's a, it's a series of buildings that we have designed, some built, and with waterways, uh, so as to make it a kind of a Venetian little campus. Uh, this, is, this is the library. 
uh, which is a new building, and it's uh, it's monumental, uh, but it uses principles, classic pr principles of proportion, and it makes it tries to make sense out of the idea of the blue sky and the sensibility of accessibility for students to come into the library. And up here at the two top corners are little, they're screen porches where the students are invited to sit outside and take their books. Now one of the main reasons those porches are there is so that students would not rip up the books and throw the pages out of the windows and therefore make the library less of a library. Uh, and less of an archive. So as it happens with the new digital technology, much of the reading that students doing, are doing on their computers, and they're not throwing them out the windows. So these, these porches are kind of a sign of the time. There's a guy up there taking, uh, and that's a photograph taken, when these porches were actually very valuable to keep the library economically sound. This is a theater uh, in, at Lynn University. Um, which is sort of inspired by the work of Frank Gehry uh, and uh, made of soft shapes which uh, work acoustically to make it sound much better. Holds about 700 people and is a very intimate uh, place uh, and they're kind of wacky curves but they're all designed because the technology of acoustic engineering is very sophisticated and the designs through these acoustical engineers provide for the opportunity for modern architecture to excel. Uh, this is a building right uh, on the other side of the campus. It's, uh, it was given by, uh, by a donor who was, who was the vice trustee, vice chairman of the board of trustees of Lynn University. And this is a guy who went through college and uh, studied comparative religion and came to the conclusion after he made a lot of money uh, in business that in fact there was as much wrong with organized religion as there is was right about organized religion and so many people have died f uh, 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 because of organized religion and of course he wouldn't list all of the battles and 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 and, and deaths that religion inspired and, and, and encouraged. Uh, and so he asked me if I could design a building that would be a spiritual place that people might love to be in and find peace and have a sense of community and being part of something other than the exclusiveness of one religion at the exclusion of others. And uh, I said, well, we try. And, and this is what we did. We, we found this spot between two bodies of water on the campus. And what we proposed was a series of seven walls which would be built uh, right on the ground and then lifted up and lean against one another so that the walls would become inter interdependent and no particular wall could stand by itself. And the only way it could work as a building would be as if all the walls were supporting each other. And the idea was a metaphor for the way spirituality and the way a belief in love and community can affect human behavior. Uh, and so the interstices, the triangles, are the leftover spaces. And so here's how it was built, a series of walls pushed up together, winding up with something out here at number four, the lower right-hand corner. And the horizontal building is where the bathrooms are and the lecture rooms are. But the space inside that, uh, these walls is a space for prayer and music, meditation, yoga. Uh, this is a picture of it at night. And this is a picture of it. With the, the, the seating on the perimeter is permanent. The seating in the middle, of course, is flexible, and it's, uh, it's used for music and, uh, and prayer. And the light that comes into it is, is, is based on the ideas of Stonehenge, uh, which was built by the Druids, oh, maybe four, 5,000 years ago, in which 
astrologically, this, when the sun would shine, or rise, I should say, at the summer solstice, the, this round temple that the Druids built would allow the light to come in to the center of the temple, to a magic circle. And, uh, and so the, those ideas were sort of based on old archaeology um, and more of the same here. You, you, these people are doing yoga, um, an Eastern um, phenomenon, uh, which um, works very well. I, I drove up to the building, oh, maybe a year or so after it was finished, because it's important for an architect to go back and see what damage he's done. I mean, just like, just like medicine, even in some way, no, not more importantly, just like medicine, an architect has to ask himself, hey, what's the first rule? Why am I doing this? And if you can answer that, hey, I'm, in, I'm not gonna do any harm, that's a pretty good answer. And I think that the doctors are probably more successful with, it, with answering the question than modern architects as we are. But nonetheless, um, once you can answer that question, oh, yes, it's worth doing, then the question is, what should I do to make it worth building? And then the next question is, how do I do it? How do I design it? So I went back and, and asked these questions of myself as I went to visit the building again, and the, the guard at the gate let me in uh, to the campus, and uh, he was a young man, and uh, he said, what building are you going to go to see? And I said, well, I'm going to go see the sanctuary. I said no more. I didn't tell him I was the architect. He, says, he said, oh, the sanctuary. That's my savior. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I got shot up pretty badly in Afghanistan, and I'm, I'm badly damaged mentally, and I have to go there. I go there in the morning at sunrise, every morning, whether I'm working five days a week or what, I go there on the weekends, and I, I'm there by myself, and I find peace, and, and I renew myself, and it allows me to go on, because every day is a, a murder for me to go through, but that is saving my life. And that's when I told him as the architect, and he, was, he embraced me and took me over there personally and told me about what, how much he, lo he loves the experience. Uh, th there's someone uh, 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 preaching. Um, another building, a modern building in, in, in New Haven, set in a residential neighborhood uh, in which the building forms themselves are broken down to be human scaled and give you a sense that this is not just a mass institution, but it's a place of light and shadow and a place of openness and invitation. And that's the little factory, uh, an arms factory actually, Marlin Arms, built over, it's not such a little factory, and they make a lot of arms, over on the right, which we were also trying to be a good neighbor towards. And then this is a building at the Yukon campus, uh, set in stores, Connecticut, in which we won a competition with Frank Gehry, who's a brilliant architect. And uh, the, the problem called for a new fine arts and performing arts center. And I believe that I can't get this, this thing to work. Jessely, where are you? Okay, here we are. Now, th the project also called for a new town square for this little town of Mansfield, which is a little village in stores. This is the main drag. This is the body of water. These are the existing buildings of the Yukon campus. And what we proposed was, and we proposed this to Frank. Frank is an unbelievably gifted artist, one of maybe the most brilliant architects that's lived in maybe the last five or 600 years. I mean, you can go back as far as Michelangelo before you find as great an architect as Gary is. But so the idea that we proposed to Frank was, hey, Frank, why don't we make a path in which, this is the main drag through the campus, in which you can get on this path and walk through the building so that people could look into the opera that's being rehearsed or being performed and the paintings that are being done and the sculpture that's being done and the music that's being played and the puppetry that's being performed and put a restaurant over here at the end, at the mouth of this new public square that we would make. So that, so that walking through this building, whether you're a student or a visitor, you would learn about what these arts are about 
and therefore be able to experience, even though you may hate art, or you may know nothing about it, and you may know nothing about it after you leave, but, but the idea of making it publicly accessible, this idea of the public realm for a private university was the idea that we had projected. And Frank said, as he always does, when he's about to do something very exciting, he said to me, you got it, Herb, I got it, let's go play. And I, I said, what do you mean, let's go play? And he grabs pieces of cardboard and starts cutting them out. And he said, this is what I mean by playing. And he starts making all these wacky figures and putting this all together. And this, whoops, wrong picture. This, yeah, those are two pictures of, of the building as it was designed. It was never executed. And I'm sorry, it was never built, never executed, executed because the recession of 2007 and 8 occurred as the fundraising started. But the idea of making these stainless steel roofs over rather conventional buildings to sort of emulate the landscape of Connecticut, which is rolling hills, soft undulating forms of green at the foothills of the Berkshires, the Appalachian Mountains, and the notion of the way light comes into these paths and spaces is, is something that, again, I regret was never built. More of the same. This is Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. New Haven is one of the two places that started urban planning in the United States. The other is Savannah, Georgia. And you know the grid of Savannah, Georgia with its marvelous courtyards. And New Haven has this one giant green of um, squares, which is a grid that Yale University built upon about 100 years after the grid was established. And it was built as a Gothic village in the early 20th century. Uh, and its architecture uh, dominated the city. This is City Hall, a Victorian revival building built by a very good American architect, Henry Austin. And this is the extension of Town Hall that we designed and built oh, in, the, uh, in the 80s, uh, a building which replaced what was the town jail which was here, done in this architecture, but had a kind of a bad connotation for all the terrible things that went on in that prison. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's now the city plan department and offices and so on. So the architecture is modern architecture, but it pays homage to the existing uh, building. And, and, I, and I hope it makes a good neighbor. And why am I going the wrong way? Ah, okay. The last building at Yale. This is Yale's Battelle Chapel, a building that, when it went Gothic in the uh, early 20th century, it erased the high Victorian architecture that preceded it. And this building, which is looks like it's all gray stone, is really just plaster painted over to make it look like the rest of the Yale stone Gothic campus. And we were asked if we would remodel this because it was kind of falling down. And one of the guys in my office started doing reading about the history of this building and found out, hey, you know, there's another building behind this building. And it's only, and it's what we're looking at, and we all think it's stone. It's only an eighth of an inch thick. It's paint. And, and uh, so I said, hey, let's go to the corporation and the administration and see if they'd be willing to get rid of that paint. And then we would put the back the paint that used to be there, and which and we had no pictures of it, but we sketched what we thought it looked like, and it was examined by chemists who said, yes, these are the colors, and so that turned into that. And that was done only with a thin layer of paint, but it's a resurrection, and it is what it used to be in the late 19th century. Uh, it was called by the Victorians the architecture of the sublime, in other words, the recognition that there is something about religion which is ineffable and which we can't understand. And that is what Victorian Gothic revival strove to show and illustrate, and long forgotten in most places, but it was for us a very special event. Now, here's another shot of downtown New Haven falling apart in the uh, late 20th century. Um, and. Uh, we revised it and revitalized it with modern architecture and renovating 
old architecture, and this is a really, this is an advertisement for an architect because we made sure we took a terrible photograph of the existing condition and replaced it with a much better looking photograph. But that's a new building in, in the center and a lot of older, older buildings that have been resurrected and a lot of new ones that have been infilled. So I, I bring it along to indicate that urbanism and the sense of urbanity and the sense of belonging to a place greater than yourself, all of these things which makes me so much in love with Palm Beach is here now and very, very special. Okay, a couple of, I, I know that some of you have started to doze, but I know some of you have started to doze. Maybe that'll wake you up. Okay, so, so this is a house in the Bahamas uh, for a family that saw a house I had designed for myself, which I'll show you in a minute, and uh, who loved the idea that we proposed of taking an old building, which we saved, the, the lower level, and built a new glass box on top of it. So it reflects the idea of the Bahamian house. The Bahamian house, which is a model for a lot of the Caribbean and Southern American architecture, has the main living spaces up on the top level with marvelous views of the sea, and, which, and the lower levels are used for bedrooms and kitchens and stuff like that. And uh, so this house was prefabricated in Miami, Florida, shipped over in a, car, in a box and erected and like, a, like sticks uh, um, held together by stainless steel connections. Uh, now this is a house in, in outside of New Haven on a round, called Round, it's on a round hill. Uh, uh, when the, when the uh, glaciers receded from the, in the north in the um, of 10 or 12,000 or even more years ago, it left these big round hills which are called drumlins. They're deposits of gravel, maybe eight or 900 feet in, uh, in diameter, mounds uh, of, uh, of stone and rock. And uh, I found one of these, which was just a forest at the time, and, and built this house on the hillside. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a house which wanted to demonstrate to myself the answer to the question is, can my big mouth be actually, can I prove myself that I can do architecture that is not stupid and overly simple, but is profound and sophisticated like traditional architecture. And so it has a big lantern up at the top and it is a solar house, and which this is the north side, so that th it's solid on this side, essentially, with an entrance in the center left, with a library over on the right, which is transparent for the eastern sunrise and the western sunset. Uh, whoops. That's a view of it. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a view of it, a, a, a daytime view of it. That's a southern exposure um, in which it's glass and open. And, the, uh, and a nighttime view sort of explaining the anatomy of how it works, and the library, and the main hall, the stairway that goes up to sort of a tree house on the top, or the same. Back up a second, the living room. Um, this is the homestead of the Rockefeller family in Tarrytown in Picantico Hills about 7,000 acres that John D. Rockefeller Center Sr. Uh, founded for his home in the late 1890s. His son, uh, John, really was the client for this work in which, and, and this was really sort of a cottage for them, uh, and, and the, uh, the servants' quarters are up at the top, and bedrooms on the top two floors with large living spaces on the ground floor, surrounded by a, go a golf course and with marvelous views across the Hudson River. And this is, this is the invisible architect in which we renovated and restored the building, but left it exactly as it is. You can't really see here, but there's slight holes, pinholes that allow light and little strips of air that come into air conditioning. It's now open to the public. The Rockefeller family dedicated it to the National Trust in uh, 1995. And this is something that was 
a euphemism for a, a barn, and it was called the coach house, um, in which the family machines and equipment, uh, the lawnmowers and so on were kept, and, uh, and, and it was converted into a conference center. And the only sign, and it's different, is that little entranceway, which sort of glorifies what used to be the garage door opening into a pedestrian point of access. That's it over there. And that's what it was like indoors. And that's what it's like now. So that the, uh, the idea of introducing modern architecture and modern interior design and, and decoration to traditional architecture is something that I'm particularly excited about. And, uh, but it's very difficult to do. And uh, I'll let you judge for yourselves whether you think it works or not. And now, this is supposed to be the fun part. And this has to do with an example of why the things I've been talking about Palm Beach really work here. Um, I talked about the peekaboo effect. The peekaboo effect is based upon the idea that in every society, whether ancient or new, whatever the ethnic backgrounds, curiosity is a sign of a child's growth and intelligence. And the peekaboo effect, the idea of playing peekaboo with a child is one of the most interesting and endearing things a parent or family member can do with a child. And you hide your face, and then you show it to the child, and the child starts hiding his or her face and shows it to you. And this can go on for days until you're exhausted. And this can go on for days, as this talk is. But the, but the, uh, the, the thought is, and the idea is that this peekaboo idea of curiosity is one of the things that binds and brings and bonds families together. And so it's the idea of the child and the parent, the idea of the adult and the aspiring to find a common way of seeing each other in the world. And the notion of what happened in Palm Beach, and I really have not explored why this happened, and maybe it's serendipitous, but it happened. And in many ways, it's the most wonderful thing about Palm Beach. It, it's, it's not a hedge fund, it's the hedges. The hedges and the green and the green walls that were placed between the public realm paths and routes and the private realm of home ownership and clubs and other private places. That hedge, that separation is punctured by necessity, by accessibility, which is required for trucks and servants and visitors and uh, deliveries. And uh, you, you got to get in and get out some way. So unlike, let's say, Cuernavaca, I don't know how many of you know Cuernavaca, which is this marvelous walled city south of Mexico City. Many, many rich live in Cuernavaca. And the walls in Cuernavaca separate Cuernavaca. People who drive through Cuernavaca have no idea what's going on in Cuernavaca because it's all walls. And those gates and doors are carefully guarded and you don't enter them very often. The gardens of Cuernavaca with the marvelous grass lawns and peacocks strutting throughout are absolutely gorgeous and a privilege to see. But Cuernavaca is not Palm Beach. Cuernavaca is not accessible to those who have not yet made it the American dream. But Palm Beach is accessible because you can walk along the paths, along the intercoastal, you can drive along A1A, you can walk up and down County Road and North County Road or drive and you really don't get to see the whole houses. And some of them are architecturally wonderful, but most are just pretty good. And they're very responsible buildings and they, they play their role and they work, and that's a wonderful thing. But what makes them absolutely wonderful is that you don't know what they really look like completely because you can't see all of them. All you can see is a peak of them. And that peak, that idea that whets your curiosity and creates an enigma of mystery between you and the objects you're looking at and this experience you have living and walking and visiting Palm Beach is so special that, and, and I think I, it's rare that I know of other places like this. And this is, and this I'll show you a few slides that show what I mean by that. 
This is one of them. This is another. That's a kind of mediocre house right behind this wall of green. But the guy who designed this wall of green was an architect of great genius. And he has made, what it's hard to see is right here, there are, these topiary are held together by tree trunks, of course, that are making them live, but they look like windows. And then there's walls coming out here. This is one of Frank Lloyd Wright's greatest compositions. Or Mies van der Rohe, who messed around with these abstract compositions in the early 20th century. These were understood by the landscape architects or the gardeners or whoever built them and made a poetry out of these hedges, which makes Palm Beach so very special. And I should say, and Sally, sitting over there trying to stay awake, is the woman who was standing in the middle of the road here trying to not get run over. But, but here I showed this picture without the other stuff so that you can see it just by itself. And this, these are marvelous abstract compositions. And there's so many of them in Palm Beach. You'd be here for days if I showed you all the great things that I, I'm not going to show you. But just, and here's one, which is very interesting. It's along North County. I think it's just before you get to the Colony Hotel. Colony Hotel on the left. The walls, the hedges have been cut away and the hedges have been placed on the building themselves. This was done with wit and humor and understanding. Whether it was conscious or not, I can't say. But the idea that the hedge has become the architectural element, not the building. And so here, because they wanted you to see, these people were very proud of their house. But on the other hand, they wanted you to understand that they, hey, we respect these hedges along North County. We're just going to leave this naked. So they took, and they took the hedge and put it against the house and made it the architecture. That's very sophisticated and, uh, and quite wonderful. And there, back at Town Hall, where the, uh, that Cafe Europa down the street on the right, these little places in this little arcade where and you can't see the people sitting in there, a couple of guys playing chess, another person reading, but it is an architecture that in itself, the hedge has become the building. And again, very, very sophisticated. Next. Oh, okay, this is Regent Park, which is a little tiny cul-de-sac right opposite the uh, Bath and Tennis. Oh, the, here we go. the Bath and Tennis Club. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm ambidextrous, but you'd never know it. Uh, but right opposite the uh, Bath and Tennis Club and the... Uh, Marvelous plantings, marvelous walls. The architecture is, and there may be more to show, I'm sorry. Yes, the architecture is very simple, not absolutely, not marvelous, well designed, good proportions, but it's the walls that are making this place very special. This is a, a magical place to visit. And you know, you're probably not allowed to visit, but you just drive in and drive right out of this little cul-de-sac and you will have experience one of the great joys of visiting Palm Beach. This place is a work of art. Uh, more of some, and then these people are this gardener who's got some idea of humanizing this corner with like three eggs or three heads or three bowling balls or whatever the hell they are. But, but it's it, the wit and the joy of doing it. And then you go down the street a little bit and he does it again, right? And there's a house behind here. But who cares? Because it's the hedges that are showing and making a public gift, a civic gesture towards the public, which again creates the idea that even though Palm Beach is for the rich, it's for me too because it's accessible to me. And I can see and understand what it is that makes being rich so wonderful. And, and so that here in Palm Beach, I think more than almost any other place, it's most ironic because I never believed this myself. And I, I went, as I say this, I think, oh, Herb, this is bullshit. What are you talking about? But, but I am convinced that this is what makes Palm Beach wonderful. It is this idea that it is possible to come to this place with however money, much money you have and find a place where you can dream about achieving the American dream. Whether you achieve it or not is not the question. It's whether, it's whether you can actually enjoy the dream. And that is what's so wonderful about this place for all these very lucky people sitting in this room and all those people who are not so lucky who want to come and join this club. But, 
So one last thing. Over on the left is the Merritt Parkway. <clears throat> the Merritt Parkway is a 40-mile stretch of land that was developed by the state of Connecticut between 1930, mid-20s, and 1938, 39. And it was designed to not go through the towns between New York and Boston, but to, but to circumvent the towns with a road that would allow people not have to get into the traffic of town to town, but drive by it and enjoy the marvelous Connecticut hillside and countryside, which was farms and soft rolling hills of the uh, foothills of the Berkshires and the Appalachian Mountains. And so it, it was designed as a park, and that's why it's called the Merritt Parkway, the first of its kind in the country. The idea was you would be able to go up and down soft hills and go through down winding roads with trees planted to open up to these views and give you the peekaboo experience that we talked about earlier that you found in Palm Beach. It's a parallel. What happened was nature had its own way. And what happened was, and nature and industry had its, both had their own ways. And what happened is all those farm fields, all those marvelous rolling views are gone. They're occupied now by urban and suburban sprawl, individual houses and developments, and some factories and office buildings. So when you imagine how it would have been like the Merritt Parkway stayed the same way it did, you'd be looking at what you look like when you drive down any post road. A jungle, a, a mess. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas about how boring is wonderful, and, but this would not only be boring, it would be chaotic. So what did nature do? Because there was no construction on the Merritt Parkway, because I-95 was built as a parallel road, which ran through the cities just to the south along the coast, and incidentally ruined the coast of Connecticut. But because the Merritt Parkway was left alone, trees grew. And the trees in this 500-foot right-of-way that was allowed for the Merritt Parkway to be expanded in the future never got expanded. And a group of us in the 1990s got together with the governor and the Department of Transportation Commissioner, and we petitioned uh, the State and uh, National Preservation Trust, which then allocated the Merritt Parkway as an historic monument. And by that time, all of the trees that were in the right-of-way grew to be great mature trees, and they created a wall between the sprawl around the Merritt Parkway. And so the Merritt Parkway now is this 40-mile green corridor. It's absolutely beautiful, but it's, you're like driving in a tunnel. You no longer get the views outside, thank God, because the views have changed. But the trees have grown, and the Merritt Parkway now looks like that. And so that you can't see all the mess that's built behind the Merritt Parkway. So there's a real parallel there between what the opportunities are in Palm Beach, it's that the architecture of the landscape, the architecture of nature, the power of nature cannot be denied. And this is, gets to the bad part of this talk. And that's what are we gonna do now? We talked about the past and the present, but what about the future of Palm Beach? And I'm frightened and you should be frightened. And we who love Palm Beach have to be aware that there will be no longer Palm Beach in a very, very short time. The acceleration of the rising water level, the rising temperature of the, sea, of the sea, the rising temperature of the air, the rising water that is going to be rising through Florida, not only coming from the edges of the east and western coast, but it's going to be rising through the ground. This limestone coral rock is, uh, it's going, to, it's going to absorb the water that is underneath rising. And we will be, we will be, if we're gonna be visiting Florida, we better bring scuba gear, scuba gear, or under, under or submarines, because it's gonna be not the Florida that we now love, and it's the Florida we can save. It is not too late for each of us to understand. And this is such a hard thing to do. Evolution moves in such strange and powerful ways that the Industrial Revolution, the power of human achievement 
in industry and technology, digital, inform digital information and so on is so, so quick, so fast, it's created an age of anxiety for us. We now, did any of you see the movie Don't Look Up? I mean, you know, and, and, and it's not a great movie, it's a, but it's a satire about what happens when this engineer scientist discovers that, uh, that a rock is outer space and within six months there will be no, the earth will be obliterated. So brings it to the president of the United States who Meryl Streep happens to play the president. And uh, <coughs> all she's trying to figure out is how to win the next election. And uh, <coughs> so she figures out with a group of other crazies that the way to escape is to build themselves a spaceship and go to another planet. And you know, it's too bad for those guys hanging around, but the spaceship gets built and they fly to another planet. planet. Of course, she leaves some of her, some of her loved ones behind. Uh, and then you arrive at the planet and there are these beautiful chickens on the planet running around there and they're gorgeous, they're big chickens. And Meryl Streep says, we found it, we found Nirvana, we're saved. And she goes over and starts to pet the chicken. And the chicken eats her. And um, the point is that if you read, and so it's not just don't look up. It's don't, don't, don't look around. Don't, don't look it up either. This is the kind of dangers that we're facing. We who are intelligent and thoughtful and have great curiosity, we have to take the lead. We, all of us, as Pogo said, we have met the, Pogo is this little beautiful possum who lived in the Okefenokee with Albert the alligator and a bunch of other animals. And Pogo stood up one day in front of these guys and he said, hey, we have met the enemy and he is us. And that's what's going on, folks. So, so we, it is not too late to look at government, to look at ourselves, to figure out a way and how to pay for all of the things that have to be done with tax deductions or with other methodologies that pay attention to this great problem we have. Right now, uh, we're facing this particular crisis between Russia and the rest of the world and the Ukrainian people are suffering so badly. And so many of us would say, well, look, we've got to put climate change aside because this is urgent and we've got to save ourselves now. Well, folks, we can't put climate change aside. If we don't pay attention to it, it's not you who will suffer. We'll be dead and gone, but our children and our grandchildren, there will be no Palm Beach. There will be no regional area around Palm Beach. There will be no Miami Beach. There will be no peninsula of Florida. It's going and we have to save it now. I've been trying in this talk to point out how wonderful it is what we have and it's up to us to save it. No one else is going to do it and it's gonna to have to be done locally and we have to build up constituencies to together and work to save this world and that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's the end of the talk, but it's not the end of the question, sure. Uh, I'll be happy for those of you who are still awake to, s to answer any questions or to provoke others. I don't know about you, but I'm looking at Palm Beach in a different way. <laughs> I never thought about the peekaboo. I never thought about the hedges, though we have been called the hedges. I hope you've enjoyed it because this is an interesting thing that we all have to pay attention to. and the and we can only pay attention to where we're living. Can't pay attention to the whole world. We have to do it here. Any questions? Well, you answered everybody's question. Yes. Oh. He Is this working? Yes. Okay, I, I, it's, it's very hard to answer that one, uh, Jane. I think that uh, maybe 30 years, uh, may, maybe 40 years, maybe 20 years. What scientists are finding out is how much uh, faster 
the uh, changes uh, in temperature are taking place and uh, the targets that are set of a one and a half degree increase is, they're not enough. We have to do more than we think we can do. And that's what's so scary about it. So it'll be a short time. It'll be in your children and grandchildren's lifetime. And what can we do about it? We, I don't know the answer to the questions, but we have to find people who do know the answers. We have to get the best experts, the best technology, the best minds to pay attention to the problem. Otherwise, we don't, we can't listen. Here's another question. What? Uh, I suppose I could ask you this because you live right next door, but maybe other people would like to hear it too. <laughs> when you're doing the work in New York City, which happens to be a place I was born and raised, they uh, have a thing now where you have to buy space going up in order to get to build something. Air rights. Yeah. Air rights. Air rights. Have you run into this uh, when you've done things in, in New York? The answer is yes. yes. I sold them. <laughs> yes, I mean, air rights is a wonderful idea. When the density and the transportation systems allow for it to take place, and so that the, uh, the movement of people, pedestrians, subways in the case of New York. New York can be much denser than it is. In fact, New York has one of the lowest pollution rates of any of uh, America's urban uh, centers. Uh, the fact that so many people are living so close together actually is saving a great deal of energy. Uh, so New York is a very good example of how it can be done. Uh, and, for, and for West Palm Beach, they don't have air rights as they have in New York. They're called density rights. And you're gonna see in West Palm Beach all these buildings going up and they're buying the density that they, from the surrounding. Next question. Frank, I think that it's a combination of serendipity and trial and error. Empirically, people found out, hey, look, this looks pretty damn good. Why don't we do it again? Someone built a hedge, and uh, they could get privacy, and uh, yet still gain access to their homes. And that's an idea that spread. Uh, I think that there were also, um, Meisner uh, had a, a vision of pathways, Baron Hausmann, who developed this in the 19th century in Paris, was, a, was a, one of those uh, guys who, how, uh, who Meisner paid attention to. And he did, it, he did the same thing in Boca Raton. You'll find certain places in Boca Raton where you get these great avenues of palm trees and so on that lead to the water and the hotel, which uh, ideas, many of which actually were then adapted to Palm Beach. So, it, so it's a combination. 